Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Logan and today we are going to be looking at the Celtic Lenormand deck. The guidebook is written by Chloe McCracken and the artwork is by Will Worthington of Wildwood Tarot and I want to say Greenwood Tarot fame. Um, I believe he's also done, done some botanical decks. Uh, I don't own any of his other decks so this is really exciting for me. I've been a big fan of his artwork for a long time but just couldn't quite commit to the decks available. So whenever I found out that the Celtic Lenormand not only features artwork by Will Worthington, but also features several um, fun and different um, alternative cards in it, um, like, you know, two, two options for snake, three options for birds, like that kind of a thing, I was really curious and wanted to dive in. I also heard, this was another selling point for me, I also heard that one of the snake cards tries to take a bit of that uh, anti-snake element out of the card. Um, so I was curious about that because so many decks just vilify snakes and I'm not down for it. I'm, I'm not down for it. They're not villains. They're not going to fuck with you if you don't fuck with them the majority of the time, you know? So the back of the box says, Celtic Lenormand brings elements of nature-based paganism to the Lenormand divination system. This 45-card deck with beautiful artwork by Will Worthington provides additional tree, animal, and people cards. In-depth descriptions for each card includes spiritual messages, affirmations, and suggestions for use in spells. The illustrated book also presents interpretations based on the phases of the moon and the wheel of the year, which I do find interesting. Um, I've not personally seen that in Lenormand before. I would also like to note that when this deck came in, I was like, I know it's mass market, but it's so, so tiny. Like the box is so manageable and reasonably sized as is the guidebook. And then I was like, oh, it's US games. <laughs> That's why they're not gonna send me a gigantic box of bullshit. Like, um, oh, I don't know, Llewellyn might. So these are the cards. They're a really lovely size for Lenormand cards. Um, I have, I think I might have just one. No, I have two decks that are like a standard tarot card size that are Lenormand decks. And I can deal with it, but it's not ideal. You wanna be able to put these out in, at some point in time, a grand tableau, you know, or at least have the option to. It's pretty much the signature uh, gigantic Lenormand spread. And that's really hard to do with gigantic cards. So I appreciate that these are a nice, reasonable size. So this is uh, the guidebook. It is very chunky. I think it has a lot of good stuff in here. Um, the, the book gives you several keywords, both in the form of nouns, descriptors, and verbs, which I find really interesting. Um, your, you know, your mileage will vary depending on what you get out of this booklet. Um, for me, I do, I enjoy having something so chock full of information, but at the same time, I do have to question some of the value therein. Um, for instance, the dark and light aspects is something they've tried to give every card, and I just, it doesn't add anything to it, in my opinion. Um, like, they're trying to say that every single Lenormand card, I'm trying to find uh, Clover in here, that every single Lenormand card has a positive and a negative meaning, regardless of if it is a positive, neutral, or negative Lenormand card. Um, and, like, I just don't know how necessary that is, because... Lenormand is so straightforward. It's like whatever card it's next to, that's going to, you know, inform sort of how positive or how negative or how neutral, you know, the message is going to be, the element of that card is going to be. Adding further dark and light aspects to it or saying that, like, you know, the clover can be a negative card because even if there's positive things next to it, the clover could minimize them and mean they won't last as long or they'll be smaller. I'm just like... <sighs> I don't know, that doesn't do anything for me. I feel like it's already a pretty specific, um, thorough system, and yeah, I just don't think that adds anything. Um, so the 45 cards in the deck feature landscapes of Brittany, which I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which is located in the north of France. Um, and that is where the Celts lived for over 500 years, and it's still considered one of six surviving uh, Celtic nations, at least, so says the guidebook. I know nothing. Um, so this deck, as you can probably tell, uh, is designed to offer symbolism and interpretations based on the phases of the moon and the wheel of the year. Um, and we also get to see 
uh, you know, the god and the goddess in the form of animals and aspects of nature in the stack, not necessarily as like humanized beings. So we'll just take a little gander through it, shall we? So first card, we have two options for the rider. We have a more masculine presenting um, and kinetic option. And we also have a more female or feminine presenting leisurely, I would argue, um, option. I think these are both beautiful. I went with this one uh, for two reasons. I loathe hot pink to my very core. Um, and also this masculine figure has longer hair than most uh, like masculine figures in cards. Uh, so I identified with that because I have long hair and we rarely get, I rarely get anything that's not like a short haired dude. So I went with this one. Um, I love that they both have harps uh, slung across them because it really lends to that bardic vibe of the the rider card which is all about going and carrying messages it's kind of like um you know a herald or it makes me think of like in fantasy novels or tv shows where you'll have like uh news is kind of carried from one town to another not only by means of you know um merchants and just travelers but also bards who go into taverns and sing tales of what they've they've experienced in other places so i really love that for the rider card clover. I would really love that we get the clover flower in this. I'm not quite sure the significance of what looks to be a coin. Um, not quite sure. Ship. And I do have, I have a couple of bones to pick with this deck, but we'll get to that. Uh, house. All right, so here with the tree cards, it was explained in the guidebook that we have the dual aspect of the god, so that's capital T, capital, capital G, um, represented in these two tree cards because on the one hand we have the oak king and then we also have the holly king. Now, I'm sure you can do a lot of interesting seasonal work with this and cyclical work with this. Um, I, however, am not very well versed in any sort of Celtic lore or mythology. Um, I've <laughs> I've got the DNA for it. I just don't necessarily connect with it very easily or very often. Um, if I'm going to work with some sort of, you know, bloodline pantheon, um, I'm generally going to turn to my, um, you know, Italian, therefore Roman side, and uh, go with go with those gods and goddesses. But you have options. Uh, here we have clouds. Per Per the Norman tradition, we do have one cloud that's a bit innocuous and one that looks like it could be bearing storms. So that's always nice to have in the reading. Um, for the snake card, now this is the thing that really captivated me for this deck. Um, my friend Galley and I were talking about how the snake card is so often like needlessly maligned in decks, and that's not just exclusive to Lenormand, you know? I feel like Snake is often something terrible in a lot of tarot decks or oracle decks as well. Um, and I'm really not here for the idea that any animal is inherently evil or traitorous. Um, the majority of the time, an animal is only going to attack you if you are somewhere that you should not be or if it is hungry, or if it is defending itself. But like, in the case of snakes, I have never in my life heard of a snake just harassing the shit out of somebody for no goddamn reason. The majority of the time is we have stepped somewhere too close to this creature, we have freaked it out, and it's going to defend itself. That's my opinion anyway. You feel free to disagree, but that's, that's how I feel about it. So I really appreciated that this deck gave us the typical, there's like a, I think the guidebook calls this the fierce snake. And then this one is, I think the shedding snake. Um, and they did something interesting and uh, gutsy for Lenormand, I think, um, because Lenor Lenormand purists, bless them, they're great, but they also, a lot of them seem to really hate change. Um, and so they sort of shifted away from like the danger aspects of the traditional snake card and went towards uh, the shedding, uh, like making the shedding of the snake the focus, so that this one has to do a lot more with transformation and cycles and growth, which is great, but that completely, in my opinion, in my practice, uh, you know, 
don't have to agree, steps on the toes of the stork card, which is supposed to be, from what I've read at least and how I interpret it, um, basically your big positive life changes, um, your evolutions, basically leveling up, right? It's when Sailor Moon whips out her magical brooch and she shouts what is like moon is it moon prism power is that the one with the brooch i can't remember anyway and then she levels up and she whoops some demon ass i uh, i don't get that for my snake card i feel like we only have 36 cards i want as little overlap between them as naturally possible you know uh so that doesn't fly for me that being said, I still use this image because it's a much more tranquil, peaceful looking image and the snake is just living its best life. It doesn't look like it's being threatened into defending itself. So I really love this image. Um, and I've recently been trying to find new ways to look at the snake card in general in Lenormand and I'm not, I'm, I'm not done finessing my idea for it yet. Um, but I do like it through the lens of like, yes, it can alert us to danger. It can alert us to possible, you know, being possibly being bitten. Uh, but it's not the snake's fault. The problem is we are somewhere that we shouldn't be. We have placed ourselves in a situation where something we do can result in us getting bitten, whether that be pursuing a toxic friendship, um, maybe oversharing, or being overly critical in the workplace, something that we have done, we have walked ourselves into an unsafe situation. Nothing's pursuing us, nothing's dogging us through tall grass to bite our ass and, you know, inject us with venom. Like, that's not the situation for me with the snake card. So I will be using, you know, that sort of vibe on it. Like, you in danger, girl, watch your footing as opposed to uh, somebody is out to get you. I don't know why the old Lenormand systems read so goddamn paranoid, but this is a this is a proper tangent, isn't it? <laughs> um, I also love the snake card as like symbolizing a wise a winding path, and therefore, it's not that somebody's dealing treacherously with us, but we can't quite tell maybe their motives because it's it's just not information that's readily available to us. That doesn't mean it's nefarious, but we can't see the whole picture yet. Um, so I do like that for Snake as well. I'll, I'll shut up about Snake. <laughs> we'll move on. Um, for Coffin, we have this sort of burial mound situation, which I think is gorgeous with these deep blues and these burnt orange colors and then the grays. Um, it's a really stunning image. We have what I'm assuming is a raven flying overhead. Um, I mean, it could be a crow, I suppose, but I want to say ravens are the... Celtic go-to for death symbolism, I mean, among other things, but for bouquet, we have, I think this is called meadow or flowers in the guidebook. This does the job perfectly fine for me. Um, I, I would prefer to see the bouquet card be a little bit easier to differentiate from the garden card, and so if we have like a meadow situation for both, especially when there's no titles, that could get a little confusing, but that's really just me, um, you know. Uh, splitting hairs over here. For scythe, it's very direct. We have the sharp implement, and then we also have the harvest behind it so that, you know, we're cautioned against quick decisions that can bite us in the ass, um, accidents, you know, maybe mishandling a pair of scissors or something, but we're, we also get that um, reaping aspect of, like, if we've been working towards something, we might just reap it uh, for good or ill, you know? I like that. For Whip, we have a, I think they titled it as Birch and Rod. I can't re quite remember what they titled it in this. Um, so generally with the Whip card in Lenormand, you'll either get a Whip, a Broom, a Besom, or like Birch Rods. Um, they all mean the same thing, really, because you can be combative with them. You can uh, have that back and forth motion, which could be, you know, like the, the verbal volley of an argument or the motion of sweeping something out. So I'm happy with that. Okay, so we get to the birds cards, right? I really love all of these options. I appreciated all these options just on a very superficial, like, what mood am I in? What aesthetic am I vibing with? Sort of level. Uh, but apparently, 
they went ahead and gave us three bird cards to like a sort of a nod to the is it tripartite goddess can i say triple goddess is that will, will that work is that the same is that acceptable because <laughs> i don't know how to pronounce that other word um so apparently the songbirds is supposed to reference the maiden aspect the whoops the chickens are supposed to reference the mother aspect, and then the owls are supposed to reference the crone aspect. Um, so I guess you could maybe look at this. I guess there are multiple ways that you can use this, right? Like depending on what sort of commu uh, community, communication, networking, like using this in tandem with the garden card is like, who should I be seeking out? Uh, who should I be spending my time with? What sort of advice do I need? I think that this could point you in the direction of very different individuals. It could also help you uh, figure out what role you're supposed to play in a given situation if you are using this more as a like a quasi significator card. Um, I really love these two. I love these two. I think they fit the theme and the aesthetic of the deck beautifully. I'm personally using the chickens one just because chickens are fucking hilarious. Um, this one is pretty. But to me, it's almost a little cutesy and overly sweet with the colors and the presentation. I don't quite think it gels with the rest of the artwork. But if you do, that's great. Uh, for the child card, we were giving t given two options. We have this one child who's more so seem to be at play. And then we have another child who is at work. Uh, they're harvesting some chicken eggs. I went with this one um, <laughs> for two reasons. One, I am a dark haired individual. The person on the card is dark haired. Um, and two, the eggs really, uh, I think, add that extra oomph of like newness and naivety or naivete, however you pronounce it, to the card's theme of that new life. So I really enjoy that aspect of it. But if you wanted to be more playful with the child card, I think this one's a really great choice. So I'm not opposed to swapping those out at some point or even using both of them. Here we have the fox card, which is just a stunning image. The greenish yellow against the orange of the fur against this blue of this, would that be a salmon leaping upstream? I don't know what that is. Absolutely stunning. Fucking love this fox card. It is gorgeous. I do want to talk a little bit about the fox card. I'll try not to go on as long as I did about the snake. <laughs> um, because this is another card that gets suffers from a lot of... Um, suffers from a bad rep that I don't think it deserves and it also gets lumped in with the snake card with meanings a lot of the time like a lot of websites you can go to or books you can read in snake and fox will both have descriptors like betrayal deceit and I'm just like I don't think we need two cards for this thing how paranoid are we trying to be um so for fox keywords it has slyness cleverness instinct falseness Work, job, skills, street smarts. I think all of this fits except for falseness. There, I, the fox is not coming after you in nature, trying to lie to you. Like that's never, it's never anything personally done to you. When a fox gets in a chicken coop or what have you, it is there because it is hungry. It will die of starvation if it does not eat. It has nothing to do with trying to fuck you over, which I think is the energy that a lot of learning materials throw on fox and snake like they're animals they're not trying to fuck you over i love it being associated with work and employment though it's it's basically anything you have to do to put bread on the table and survive it is adaptability it is cunning and cunning is not a negative thing cunning is something that keeps a lot of creatures alive so while i don't appreciate the falseness or uh manipulation underhanded like these these very, like, I don't know, poo-pooing on the, the fox energy in general. It's a lovely depiction of the card, and I do really appreciate that they at least incorporated a lot of the other positive aspects of the card, because, in my opinion, it really is a neutral card. Um, you know, it could be neutral positive some days, it could be neutral negative, but it is not a bad card by any means. Was that shorter than the snake rant? I hope so. <laughs> Bear is beautiful, but after the lovely color story that is fox it's just it's a little dimmer for me not as exciting but it's beautiful this sars card is so stunning the sea we have the moon we have maybe a pole star over here i don't know it's a beautiful just velvety black sky this 
Mariner maybe using the stars to navigate. It's just such a cool interpretation of the card, um, or the illustration of the card, I should say. Um, I've been hoping to see a star card that has more to do with, like, Mariner's navigating, and so it's really cool to see this. Um, the star card in my Black Salt Lenormand, Pink Sugar Lenormand, and another deck I'm currently working on all feature, like, a uh, compass, star-shaped compass, and so I, I love the navigation aspect coming into that. Well done. Well done. This is a beautiful Storks card. Um, I almost would have been happy with this as a tower card because it has the bell tower in it, if that was more of a focal point. Um, Stork. We're going to get a little bit ranty for another minute, and then it should be pretty smooth sailing, okay? Um, <laughs> if we've been hanging out at all, if you've been here for more than one video, clearly you don't mind a little salt and spice and rant. Um, so, for the Stork card, this is where we had a little bit of a bit of overlap with that other snake card where it's talking about transformation and big positive changes and improvement. Um, this guidebook does mention this card being largely associated with migration, which is fine, but we already have the ship card conveying long journeys to us, so I don't think we need two cards that comment on a long journey. Um, outside of the migration, I fail to see how storks symbolize improvement, evolution, leveling up. To me, the only way you can really look at that big transformation coming from stork energy is if we're not even stork energy, stork, I don't want to call it folklore, <laughs> fake lore, I don't know. The fucking storks bring in the fucking baby, right? Like, and that's assuming that adding an, an infant into your life is going to improve things. I assure you it would not improve things for me. So, I... I've recently come to take issue with the Stork card. I think they're beautiful cards. I think they're beautiful birds. But to me, thematically, like uh, symbolically, it does not make sense for big improvement and leveling up. What I want to see is something that is an actual symbol of leveling up. So instead of Stork, why don't we have a Chrysalis or a Cocoon? Because that is literally going from one form that is less effective than your final form. <laughs> like if it wasn't for entering a Chrysalis and a, and a Cocoon, so many species of like butterflies and moths i i assume would die i know that's at least true of the luna moth i'm assuming it's true of others um we need that transformation it's like the hanged man like you have to go through that in order to reach your highest potential um so i don't know how we wound up with a stork for that instead of a cocoon aside from the fact that the world is extremely heteronormative and tries to push tries to push like you know you're not being a successful adult and you won't be happy unless you pop out 2.5 children kind of thing and like parenthood if that's your deal that's fantastic i'm not trying to shit on that i just don't think we should that should be like the go-to prescription for every individual and so that's why i have issues with the stork card um i really love this because we have dog and cat uh, a really great option um i could see people leaving both of these in because dog could represent that friend who's there no matter what and maybe they're you know be a little clingy and needy uh but they're devout and glorious for it and so sweet and then cat could be that friend who's a bit more aloof a bit more you know into the self-care and maybe not always going to text you back right away um I'd like to see this as maybe like your Leslie Nope kind of friend, and then this is your Donna Meagle kind of friend. Um, it's fantastic. They're both fantastic. But for my own personal use with this deck, I am definitely going with the Donna Meagle friend, um, which is all Parks and Rec's references, if, if you don't know. All right, our next card is a like a hilltop fortress, uh, which I think is really cool for the tower. It works. It's imposing. I have no problems with it. Uh, 20 Garden. You see, like this, it has a picnic in it, so it's a bit clearer that it, this would be a garden setting than the flowers card. But I, you know, you know, I digress. For mountains, we have these cliffs, which are just really gorgeous. And I love the idea of using a cliff such as this instead of the traditional uh, mountain scene. So, sorry, I don't know if you heard that, a huge limb, it sounds like, just fell on our roof. I'll have to check that out later. <laughs> um, things shook. So then we have 22 for crossroads. Um, I guess this is like a sort of, some sort of Celtic signpost of sorts. 
Um, I think it's really beautiful. It's really effective. We have a forked path leading to two very different looking destinations or um, roadways at least. So I'm into that. Mice, I love this because it perfectly sums up the card. We have something that is tiny and quiet coming in and leeching some sort of resource of ours, be that our energy, our finances, um, our literal food, uh, and just slowly eating away at it. And we're not going to notice normally because these are mice are quiet, right? I think. <laughs> so I think this does a really good job. Um, this card for heart, uh, I think is pretty, but I do think it kind of misses the brief as far as making the symbol first and foremost in the image. So when I first looked at this, I had to remind myself of what number card heart is supposed to be, because I was like, am I, the, the subject should be somewhere here or bigger, right? It'd be more noticeable. This, at least in person, is very, very out of the way and tiny. So we have what looks like a, an opened muscle or clam or mollusk or something. And that's fine. It's natural world. It's beautiful. I'd rather this than like an actual bloody heart on a table for this deck, for any deck. <laughs> It'd be a little, little um, OTT for me. But yeah, I, I would like this if, like, it's fine if we keep it as the mollusk, uh, but if we can just make it bigger or something to where it's a more attention grabbing. And I had briefly the same issue with the ring card. Uh, thankfully, the clasped hands really do convey that message of partnership, but the ring is so tiny. And even the clasped hands are like, it's a very odd composition, I guess is what I'm getting at. I don't think the composition of these are as good as the rest of the cards, so I don't think they're as powerful as the rest of the cards, but they're still serviceable. Um, book, I really fucking love this book card. Uh, I want to learn about this type of book where it's just like two giant slats of wood bound together with ribbon, like what's on the inside? Do you open it and it's like sheets of parchment? Do you open it and it's paintings or something scrawled on the inside of the wood? It looks beautiful and I'm extremely curious. Here we have letter, <laughs> another branch fell, and the cats scattered like cockroaches. That's what that sound was. Um, here we have letter, which I think is really great. It looks like they're written, these look like the Oum symbols, don't they? It might be something else, but it looks like Oum to me. So I think that's really beautiful, and I'm honestly curious to see what it translates to. Okay, then we have our person cards. I think they did a pretty good job with these. They gave us four of them um, so that we can account for multiple people in our lives. We can account for, you know, same-sex relationship readings, so that's all fantastic. Um, they're, they're very within the gender binary, which is fine. Some things are like that. It's fine. I can still see myself in this, even though I'm not a super, you know, noble warrior, mustachioed man, or a woodcutter, or, you know, either of these two. Um, but I do appreciate having the options. I did go with this person for my significator, uh, just because he looks very festive, um, and he has dark hair. So I'm, I'm going to go with that. And I think I chose uh, this one in the brighter garment, just because I actually like the way this person is drawn or painted more, but this color scheme is just way more dynamic and eye-catching to me. I feel like this garment kind of blends in with the thatch on the roof. Um, I'm really, I'm really only having negative art critiques for like very few of the cards and most of them involve people. <laughs> so maybe I just don't love the way Will Worthington uh, illustrates people. The Lily's card is very beautiful. I'm not sure what type of Lily it is, but it's soft. It's quiet. Um, it looks really peaceful. So I really enjoy that. Uh, the sun card is fine. Gets the job done. It's right there. It's the sun. The moon card, on the other hand, hold the phone. Look how beautiful this greenish tinged sky is, or these rocks along the shore. Like, it is so borderline ooky spooky. It gives me, like, the green light emanating from uh, Minas Morgul in, I think it's Minas Morgul, in Lord of the Rings. Um, is it the Fellowship? No, not the Fellowship. Uh, is it the Two Towers that we see the the stairway to Shelob's lair and all that. Um, it gives me that, but I can't remember. I think it's two towers. Huh. The key, it's basic. It gets the job done. It's front and center. I like it. Fish, 
not the most dynamic color palette, but it does get the job done and I like it. Anchor, it's totally fine. I'm not crazy about it, but it's totally fine. And then Cross, um, I think the colors in it are beautiful. Again, not a fan of crosses, but that's just me. I do really love these bits of, is this like lavender or is, or is purple heather a thing? I don't know what it is, but if we're talking Northern France, I'm guessing that's lavender. It looks like lavender. Um, it's really beautiful though, and the sky is pretty, it's well done. Um, I am really excited to work with this deck and to read the guidebook a bit more. Um, just to see how they manage to work the affirmations in and the spell uses in and the deities in. The deities probably won't do much for me because as I said, I'm not really familiar with Celtic craft and I don't really have an interest in it for myself. Um, but a lot of thought was put into this guidebook. So I'm very curious to see um, what McCracken has to offer in it. Yeah, it's a really lovely deck. Uh, the cardstock is, it's, it's totally fine. Like it feels durable, it's not overly thin. Um, it's that, it's glossy, but it's not offensively glossy. Um, it's not like, you know, some decks, it's like a photographic gloss over it. I hate that so much. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to work with this deck. I will probably use this tree card just because I love winter and holly and I find the sky to be uh, more interesting looking in it. <clears throat> Nothing to do with the actual, you know, uh, holly king versus oak king. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to work with work with this one. Please tell me, have you worked with this one? Um <clears throat> Is if you don't read Lenormand, is a Will Worthington deck a place that you think you would start to read Lenormand? Um, I have a friend who is on the fence with Lenormand, and I think she is keeping her eye out for this deck, so I might see what it costs in her area and go ship that to her <laughs> for my own benefit so that I have another friend to talk with about Lenormand. Um, and also, I just think this would be a really good beginner's deck because of how juicy this guidebook is. And, um, you know, even though it has some things in it that I've complained about, like the Storks heteronormative, everybody should have a baby symbolism, um, or, you know, the thing with the snake. Also, the snake is supposed to symbolize, in this book at least, uh, a woman. So it's a, a dangerous woman. And don't get me wrong, I love the idea of dangerous women, you know, Ariana Grande or not, but um, I don't like the idea of, like, the biggest like oh no look out for betrayal and an evil person card to also be like the other woman card and quite literally the other woman <laughs> I don't know maybe it's not misogynistic it just feels a little icky to my um how about we how about we try to afford women some uh some measure of respect as if they were actual humans sensibility you know <laughs> so there's that um but it's really lovely. The artwork is lovely. And I am now just droning on and repeating myself. So I hope you've had fun uh, with this walkthrough. Thank you so much for sitting with me. And I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Goodbye.